Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Armored Conspiracy Files. Still sitting on that name. This series is very different from anything I've ever done before. I get a little bit more close up and personal, and I describe some of the more obscure conspiracy theories that I've researched over the years. It's just some harmless speculation. Last time I gave you an introduction into my grand unified theory, postulating that all of written history is fabricated, and that humanity actually progressed completely differently than we were taught in school, and our civilization went through a major reset as recently as the Victorian era. If you missed part one, you're definitely gonna wanna see that first. I'm not just saying that to get more views, it really does set up the series and give you context for everything that I'm gonna be talking about. And the plan with this series is to eventually build up to explaining who we really are and why we can't remember anything about our past. But today's video, I promised you that I was going to be talking about Tesla technology and how it's actually much older than the work of Nikola Tesla and actually dates back to the beginning, to Atlantis, to ancient Egypt. Some people call this antiquitech, like antique technology, or technasmia, that's the other name I've heard. In this series, I'm just gonna refer to it as old world technology. This is actually the subject that got me started into the whole alternative history thing, and it was sort of by accident. I've heard the theory that Tesla technology is actually based on much older technology before, but it all sort of just clicked in my head by accident one day when I was researching Tesla technology and the mud flood at the same time. What I found was a pattern, a grid layout of buildings that persisted throughout history, which ties ancient Egypt together with the Victorian era. But before we get started here, there seemed to be a little bit of confusion about the last video. People seemed to think that I'd turned to the dark side or something. This series is just for fun. Don't take it too seriously, okay? Now let's get started. All right, ready? Go. Guys, my third eye is wide open and I have literally solved the riddle of the Sphinx. I'm being completely serious. But before I risk my life giving you all of this hidden information, I'm gonna need a little bit of help for my sponsor, ExpressVPN. These days, everything you're doing online is being tracked. You might not realize just how little privacy you actually have. You're being monitored by your ISP, cell phone provider, advertisers, hackers, and even the government. Thanks, Obama. Is that joke too lame? No, I'm just too low energy. Could I get a large double-double? Woo! Thanks, Obama! It's a good joke, that's gonna land. That's, that's gonna land. My entire livelihood is online, so I can't risk DDoSers or hackers hindering my content. So I never go online without using a VPN. Using ExpressVPN will mask your identity and hide your IP address, hindering people from digging up your personal info. Websites you visit can't track you, and even your internet service provider can't log your activity. It'll be like you were lost to history. Along with privacy, security, and anonymity, ExpressVPN also allows you to change your location. This will help you get around region locks, allowing you to watch content that isn't normally available in your region. There are 94 countries to choose from. And the best thing about ExpressVPN is how easy it is to use. All you gotta do is just open the app, press the button, boom, you're protected. Wanna change your location to some place with a silly flag? Click location, click Isle of Man, boom, protected. And ExpressVPN is simply the best VPN there is. They have 24 hour customer support. They have consistently fast bandwidth speeds. They were voted best VPN by Tech Radar, and they're so confident in their encryption that they even give you the tools to test their leak proofing ability. Take back your internet privacy today for less than $7 a month for 12 months, and you're even eligible for an extra three months for free. All you gotta do is click that link in the description below. ExpressVPN.com Slash skeptic. That's expressvpn.com slash skeptic. And by clicking that link, you help to support my channel. Now can we please get back to my extremely intellectual video where I debunk 500 years of established academia. Thirty-three. If you're into conspiracy theories, chances are you've heard that number before. There are 33 degrees of Freemasonry, right? Uh, who needs Freemasonry? I can figure all this 
it out on my own. I'm sure that you've been told a thousand times before that when you see the number 33 in media, that they're indicating the Illuminati or Freemasonry, but that's not entirely true. 30 degrees latitude, 30 degrees longitude. That's the exact location of the Giza Plateau. Egypt is where it all began. Have you ever heard of Electrum. It's actually a naturally occurring dirty gold. It's sort of a mix between gold, silver, and copper. It was referred to as green gold by the Greeks, or also white gold. And do you know where you find it? Coating the tops of pyramids and obelisks. Gold and silver and precious metals in electronics today, because of how conductive they are, it's really good for electronics. Of all the subjects that I'm going to talk about in this series, this is definitely my favorite. Tesla has always been a great point of fascination for me. I've even gone as far as to call him my hero, which there's very few people I actually admire like that. The famous Tesla Tower on Long Island, the image of it transferring electricity to the atmosphere, this is just etched in my mind. This laboratory was like something out of a comic book, and I know that it's a museum today, but I really wish that I could have seen this thing in working order. The tower is destroyed now, they took it down at the end of the experiment when the money ran out, and also famously after Tesla died, his entire collection of blueprints and patents were stolen from his hotel room by by the United States government. He wouldn't be considered too revolutionary today, but for his time, he was like on some other level. And though a handful of his more important inventions still persist today, like alternating current and the electric motor, the overall spirit of his work has gone completely extinct. Luckily, we can still look up a few of the remaining diagrams from his unclassified projects, and electrical engineers and scientists seem to be able to reproduce aspects of his work, like Tesla coils, used more as like a party trick. But most people seem to be completely confused about what he was actually trying to do with his Tesla tower and the whole wireless energy experiment. Part of the confusion actually has to do with the way that the media reported on it. That's surprising. What Tesla was actually trying to do was get electricity waves to resonate throughout the atmosphere so that it could be picked up anywhere with wireless energy receivers. The problem with electricity waves is they actually diminish over distance, the further away you get from the source, the weaker the strength of the field. I mean, his tower was grounded deep under the earth, down into the water table, but that wasn't the business end of the machine. The business end was the tower. Tesla was actually running an alternating current generator off of an oil engine inside of his laboratory, and he was pumping that electricity up through the tower. The inside of the tower actually contains a Tesla coil. Tesla quite famously created electrical fields that wouldn't harm anyone that walked through them. But any electrical device, like say a light bulb, would turn on completely wirelessly. Tesla's experiment actually included two buildings, both the Tesla tower and a brick building with a chimney, the laboratory. Both of those facilities were actually connected to each other. Now I'm a complete layman myself. I really don't know much about electrical engineering. I've just heard this theory before that Tesla was copying the technology at the Giza Plateau. People have been arguing that the Giza Plateau was a power plant for like 30 or 40 years now. The theory is that with a gold or copper capstone at the top of the Great Pyramid, which was collecting atmospheric energy, it could then be drawn down into the King's Chamber, where inside of the sarcophagus was like an Ark of the Covenant sort of device. And then somewhere the electricity was discharged into the surrounding atmosphere as a field. We already know that the Egyptians had a little bit of electricity. We found devices known as bag Dad batteries, because Baghdad had them too, I guess. Basically, they put copper and zinc in grape juice and they were able to create a small charge. Mythbusters actually explored the theory that the Ark of the Covenant was actually part of a circuit. One of the elements of this theory is that the Great Pyramid device required water to be running underneath it. And there are a series of aquifers and tunnels that are underneath the Giza Plateau, and they do go beneath the Great Pyramid, which you should be able to access from the well in the basement of the Great Pyramid, but you can't because they've intentionally filled it with sand. The theory is that the water running beneath the pyramid helps amplify the atmospheric collection 
process somehow. I don't know if I fully understand, but Tesla had the same thing. He actually had copper wires running down from the tower down into a large copper disc that was sitting in the water table. But free energy, atmospheric energy collection is a real thing and you can even do it from home. The principle is so simple that even an idiot like me can understand it. So the atmosphere has what we call an ionosphere. It is a series of sheets of ions. Ions are just molecules or atoms that have either been given an extra electron or have been deprived of one of their electrons. The natural state of our atmosphere is to be positively charged. That actually happens as particles are being bombarded into our atmosphere. And usually, naturally, our ground is negatively charged. But that's just on clear days during stormy rainy days it can all get flipped around all that matters for the energy collection device is that electricity is traveling through the wire in a direction it doesn't matter which one so ion sheets they don't like to go around things they actually like to go over them sort of like you're covering it in a blanket so when you build a tall structure like a church tower the ions are actually traveling up and over and are actually collecting and stacking at the top, they're, they're concentrating on a single point above the structure. So the higher you build it, say at the top of a giant mountain, the more sheets of ions are going to be collecting at the top of that antenna, meaning the more electricity is going to be traveling through it. So if you have like a lightning rod or a weather vane, or a church cross, or that crescent moon at the top of a mosque, if you were to just connect a grounded wire to that, you have electricity in like every old building around the world. That's how easy it is to create atmospheric energy in these already existing old buildings. Almost all of their roofs are made from copper. I'd previously demonstrated generating power using atmospheric electricity. A hexacopter was used to lift one end of a wire high up into the air. Meanwhile, the other end of the wire was connected to a corona motor near the ground. Electricity then flowed through the wire and corona motor, making it turn. So last time I told you that the water erosion around the Great Sphinx suggests that it's at least 12,000 years old. What I I didn't tell you is that there was a group of researchers, including Graham Hancock, they mapped the stars and turned back the clock to about 11,000 BC. What they discovered is that about 11,000 years ago, on the summer solstice, was when the constellation Leo rose with the sun. So that means the Sphinx is facing the great lion in the sky right on the summer solstice. But on top of that, at that exact same moment, the belt from the constellation Orion perfectly lines up with the orientation of the pyramids. The entire layout of the Giza Plateau serves as a time capsule telling us exactly when it was built. I'm not going to get too deep into it in this video, but there seems to be a great cosmic connection between Orion and Leo. They seem to be eternally linked together. But this relationship is not just observed in Egyptian religion, it's actually observed by every religion. The first clue is that the constellation Orion is often depicted as either battling a lion or holding a lion. The Egyptians called it Osiris, the god of death and renewal, probably because it went away at the end of the season when winter began, which is the dry season in Northern Africa and Mesopotamia. Nature was obviously less bountiful at this time, so it would have been very beneficial to know when there was less food to eat. When Osiris came back in the spring, the the sun would sit above his head as it rose above the horizon. This would bring the spring melt, which resulted in the Nile River flooding. The Nile still floods every year. This is from snow melting on the mountaintops further south. But the Nile River has actually migrated quite a bit. Back in ancient times, the river actually traveled much closer to the Giza Plateau. And during the flood season, it actually turned the plateau into an island. It's possible that the ceremonial importance of the Giza Plateau has to do with the fact that it was an island in ancient times. Perhaps a group of hunter-gatherers got trapped there and had to use it as refuge, kind of like the Giza Plateau was an ark where they could keep all their animals and their food to be safe 
during the flood season. We know from stone circles across northern Africa that the Africans already knew about astrology at this point, but it was from the Giza Plateau that they really honed their religion. I also told you in the previous video that I also believe that the Sphinx used to be a lion because the head seems to have been recarved, but the head also seems to be made from a different material, which means that perhaps there was no head at all. And if you look at the fine details of the Sphinx, like all of the lion parts are all brick. None of them are actually part of the original stone. And the core body of the Sphinx is the most eroded part. So what's underneath all that brickwork? Well, if you take a top-down look of the Sphinx, you get sort of a round part on one end and then sort of a flat part on the other. It makes a keyhole shape or maybe a fish. The stone is the shape of Orion. It's the exact same shape as the Tesla Tower. You actually see this keyhole shape in other places around the world. Most people don't know about this row of keyholes in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is home to a lot of really important ancient artifacts that they just hide from the rest of the world. This is Japan. There's actually a bunch of them in this picture. And this is what they look like naked without any trees. Technically, this is a type of pyramid. Most cultures that have incorporated the Sphinx seem to see it as a female. The Greeks certainly saw her as a female, and I'm betting that the Egyptians did too. The Egyptians actually had a female cat goddess named Sekhmet. She took several different forms depending on her mood. One as simple as a tame little house cat. The Sphinx actually represents the relationship between Leo and Orion, and I can actually do a video on just the subject alone showing how all religions still show homage to this relationship and how they all tie back to ancient Egypt. And if you remember in our last video, I discussed the lost civilization of Tartaria. Remember their flag was a griffin. And a griffin is just another version of the Sphinx. You'll also notice that the griffin is standing on three legs. I'm sure you've heard the riddle of the Sphinx from Oedipus Rex. When it walks on four legs in the morning, that represents childhood. When it stands on two legs in the afternoon, that represents adulthood. And when it walks on three legs in the evening, that represents old age, like it's walking walking on a cane. Well, I want you to start looking at statues that are outside of these government buildings. Look at their lion or their sphinx or even their horse, whatever animal they've got. Look to see how many legs it's standing on. If you find a statue standing on three legs, what that's indicating is that that ties back to the oldest tradition. So after ancient Egypt fell from the flood, and then tried to rebuild itself afterwards and spread across the earth, all of these emerging cultures ended up rediscovering this technology and even improving it over time. Even as they evolved this technology into the Victorian era, they were still using animal symbols and hieroglyphics to describe what these buildings and what these machines were doing. I can't really go over what they all mean in this video. These swirls at the top of the Greek pillar could be communicating a toroidal field, which is also generated by the top of a Tesla coil. Bird wings are also an important feature. Almost every nation ever has the symbol of an eagle with its wings spread wide open. That actually represents an electromagnetic field. If you look at what a magnet does to a bunch of metal files, it makes it look like a couple of wings that have spread open. But I'm gonna save that for another video. The point I'm making is that there's a ton of ancient Egyptian symbols that we still use today that we really don't know the meaning of. If you learned about this in school, you were likely taught that atmospheric energy collection technology is a dead end. But it's stupid to abandon a technology because its base form doesn't really create that much energy. That would be like after the invention of the first two-stroke motor, they put it into an RV and realized it couldn't get it up a hill, so they just abandoned the engine. You can improve an engine. You can add more cylinders. You can compress the air intake. You can add better injectors. You can open up the exhaust. There's lots of ways to scale that technology up. So if you could scale up that atmospheric energy just enough to boil water, then you could use that steam to either run an electric generator or power a steam engine. And electric steam engines were a thing. Those existed back in the steam era. You could also negatively charge the antenna, which would help encourage atmospheric energy transfer, maybe even magnetize it. Next, you could ionize the air. And I think that this is where running water comes in. You don't need a large particle collider to create ions. You don't need a large laboratory. All you need to do to ionize the air 
is drop water. There are some processes that are constantly generating atmospheric ions. As water droplets collide with each other or with wetted surfaces with high velocity, the water molecules create this electrified spray with negative ions that can be transferred to the air around it. Depending on your distance from the waterfall, ion levels can reach tens of thousands of ions per cubic centimeter. But doing that creates oxygen molecules that negatively ionize the air. So you would have to reverse the polarity of the antenna if you did that. So if you have running water going underneath the structure, it could be creating negative ions that fill the building up, which would help negatively charge the structure. And that would make the whole structure a negative magnet pulling positive ions out of the sky. And a lot of people seem to think that they feel health benefits to being in negatively charged ionized areas. Drinking ionized water supposedly is healthy too. I can't really speak to that, but I can say that when I hang out in negatively ionized areas like Niagara Falls or behind the falls in the tunnels, I feel really good. So if these structures were using ionized air, they were also creating ionized water and perhaps they were feeding this ionized water to people and maybe that's why we have a cultural memory that these old churches and cathedrals had holy water because we expect when we go there that there's supposed to be this special water there waiting for us. Since we forgot what it was for, we just said, oh yeah, the, the priests, they bless it and then they drown your baby in it. There's a rich collection of archived information that's been recently released out of Switzerland. They're scanning it all and putting it all on the internet for us. Some of the stuff that's coming out of this archive will absolutely blow your mind. People before the modern era had a very different philosophy behind science and a very different perspective of the universe. You've likely heard of alchemy, basically the precursor to chemistry. Alchemy is some crazy wizardry that I'm not even remotely qualified to discuss. But they also had a completely different understanding of physics. Recently, I found a couple things from the late 1600s and early 1700s that supposedly came out of this archival collection. This poorly scanned drawing is depicting a monument, one very much like this. If you look at these curved lines, each numbered with Roman numerals, they seem to be depicting the exact same principle of layers of ions than I demonstrated earlier. These kinds of monuments can be seen on the ground, usually as a centerpiece in a park, or they can also be on the top of a large classical building like the massive government building in San Francisco. So this diagram is hint number one, but this second diagram this really changed my life. There are two structures. The one on the left is a tower, like a church tower with an antenna on the top. And there seem to be lines coming down from the air hitting the top of the tower. That's interesting enough on its own, but when you look at the tower on the right, it seems to be ejecting something into the air. Then above that, the artist has clearly demonstrated an air pocket. It's holding whatever the second tower is ejecting into the air, and then it's transferring it over to the first tower. This is actually from a physics book that's dated to the late 1600s, and it's written in Latin. My Latin's not that great. I don't know about you, but I spent a little while reading this and trying to figure out what it was trying to depict. This tower on the right, with what appears to be an open top, is ejecting things like black powder, sulfur. Basically, it's ejecting some sort of a cloud of explosive materials like gunpowder. The pocket of air is holding that cloud and is creating love. So I'm thinking that love means some kind of a harmony or a marriage of these elements in the air. And then the air is carrying it over to the tower on the left with the antenna. So this is the strange part. The tower on the left with the antenna, this is all it says. Naturally. Basically, the book is implying that and then naturally you get the process over here. So, so like the diagram is assuming that the reader already knows what's happening to that first tower. Like this is the obvious part of that process that everyone should already know. So what if the tower on the right is collecting water to ionize the air, mixing it with gunpowder, then it feeds it down under the ground through aquifers underneath the main structure, and that effect is creating a charge that 
the main building is able to collect. So this is when I realized that almost every surviving neoclassical building is or was part of a grid a row of structures that are always adjoined with each other. There's always a domed or a towered structure on one side with an antenna or a weather vane of some sort. And then on the other side is usually a round structure or an oval structure. It's not always round, but usually is. And it always has either an open top or open sides. And the secondary structure is almost always directly next to flowing water. Of course, rivers over time deviate and change shape. Sometimes you get both buildings adjoined into one, a round half and a tower half, but that appears to be less common. There's usually other features in this grid as well. There's almost always an obelisk or a pillar or a tall statue, some sort of pointed feature in the park that's a focal point. Now there's a fourth feature that these grids will have, and it's the least common one, or at least the hardest one to find evidence for if it's no longer around, and that is a water fountain or a water feature of some sort. I know what you're thinking. Every building has a water fountain. True, but I'm thinking that this tradition actually started as a way to feature this ionized water. Let's look at Paris. This is an extreme example, but I thought that we'd start here because this is what Da Vinci Code was talking about. Usually these are laid out in a rectangle. On one side here we have what is now a military building. It looks more like it used to be a palace. And behind that is a small obelisk. We'll call this Building 1. Then the grid extends into the park, and we cross our first water feature. Further into the park we have the Eiffel Tower itself surrounded by water. And in entirely metal structure piercing high into the ionosphere. Then we continue to the other end past, yes, a running river, and we have a giant water fountain with extremely powerful jets firing directly towards the Eiffel Tower. But the really tragic part about this particular grid, the secondary structure has been gutted. Example number two, here's the Vatican. The main structure, of course, is St. Peter's. Then we have an obelisk and fountains in the square. Then you follow this straight line all the way down and next to the flowing river, a round structure, Castle St. Angelo. And the neat thing about this grid is it actually makes the shape of a key. Clearly, these structures are meant to be associated with each other. Example three, Washington, D.C. The Capitol building is the main structure and the Washington Monument, of course, is the obelisk, with the reflecting pool, that's the fountain. Then at the other end is the Lincoln Memorial, next to flowing water, and of course has open sides. And this grid actually forms a cross, there are two complexes here, sharing the obelisk. We've got the White House on one end, that's the main structure. Then on the other end is the Jefferson Memorial, next to flowing water, and of course also has open sides. Honestly, I could show you hundreds of these, they're all around the world, but I'm just gonna show Show you one more, my hometown of Kingston, Ontario. Of course, City Hall, that's the main structure. Then on the other end is a Martello Tower we call Shoal Tower, and that's literally inside the water. There's actually four of these Martello Towers in Kingston, but there are hundreds of them around the world. These are defensive towers, and supposedly they were designed specifically to fend off ships. So every single one of them is either on the water or in the water. Then in the center of the park is a water fountain, and though there isn't an obelisk of any kind, there is a ring on the ground that is right where I would want an obelisk to be. There used to be a triangular defensive wall on the top of the park here. I was told this is an access hatch to the pipes under the fountain, but this is right in the middle of the pathway, and it kind of makes an eye of the pyramid shape above City Hall here. And I also found an old record depicting a suggestion to put an elevated platform around the ring with steps surrounding it. I don't know if this was ever constructed, it might have been an old design, but I've even found in obscure small towns that they have this exact grid layout. Sometimes the designers get clever with these water fountains and they combine the function of the pillar and the fountain into a single structure. So again, back to Kingston, Ontario, we have another building that looks just like City Hall, the Frontenac County Courthouse. There's 
There's a water fountain in front of that structure, and you see how it has two lions in it? Have you ever thought about why lions are outside of every government building? Have you ever noticed how often lions are depicted in water or are associated with water? Lions hate water. They can swim if they have to, and they do swim during the wet season. But you wouldn't think to associate lions with water, yet they very often are. This is because the Sphinx is actually associated with the flood season in Africa. At first, the flood season was chaos. The original people couldn't handle its power, but eventually they made order out of that chaos. They turned that annual flood into something that they didn't just look forward to, but something that they needed to survive, something that fed the machine. The Great Sphinx is not only the lowest point on the Giza Plateau, it's actually below the floodplain. Geologists said to explain the erosion, they needed sustained rainfall for hundreds of years. And that's why conspiracy theorists say that the Sphinx has to be at least 12,000 years old. But I don't need 12,000 years to explain hundreds of years of rainfall. I just need a few thousand years to explain hundreds of years of sustained water flow. Look at this strange protrusion behind the arm of the Sphinx. Have you ever wondered what this is? Anyone who knows water engineering knows that if you want a standing pool of water without it rising too high, then you need to create a water overflow inlet that is exactly as high as you want the water level to rise to. That's right. The Sphinx was a water fountain. In fact, it was actually the main water inlet for the Giza Plateau machine. Every year during the flood, the river would rise up, the water would pour into the Sphinx, the overflow would go in the inlet behind the Sphinx's arm, through the aquifers, through the Osiris chamber and under the well beneath the Great Pyramid. The Great Pyramid famously has all sorts of strange tubes and tunnels carved into the stone. From the King's Chamber, there's two square tunnels that lead outside of the Great Pyramid pointing up into the sky. If wind is blowing on one side, it's going to force air in through the one tunnel and then out through the other one. And what that will create suction, forcing whatever ionized air is being created in the well up into the king's chamber. And it's possible that that was also sucking some of water up as well, and that that water was flowing out of the Great Pyramid back down into the Sphinx. That's why the Sphinx has all the water erosion. That constant water flow in and out, in and out. That way, if the Nile dried up during the dry season, they still had enough water stored in their system that that machine could just keep running. So I think this is why in that neoclassical grid structure, there's always one building right next to the water. That is the water inlet. That thing's pulling in water that's being used by the machine. And I think the reason they're round is to maximize how far the water has to travel down. The more you make it spiral to go down, the more you end up ionizing the water and ionizing the air. And the thing with water towers is that they can look like any other building. Here are twin water towers. They don't look too different from the Martello Towers. Here's another one. Again, round, has windows. Doesn't look too different from the Martello Towers. But remember that old physics book also mentioned black powder, sulfur. So I'm thinking that when our civilization came along and we found these structures that had black powder in them, we spun some story about them being defensive structures so that it would make sense to us. This is Murney Tower. It's another Martello Tower in Kingston. This one's actually a museum. I've been in here many times. Yes, it may have been a defensive structure at one point, but more recently it was actually a residence. Even private citizens lived in there all the way up to the 20th century. The Red roof on this tower is actually a modern addition. Obviously, with cannons on the top floor, it was designed to have an open top. First of all, can you even live in a water tower? Does that make sense? Yes. 
Well, we call this structure a hanging tower, but this is actually an old water tower built in the 1800s for Kingston Penitentiary. Apparently to this day, the water tank is still up there. And you can clearly see there are windows. There were people living in this building all the way up to the 20th century. So how are the Martello Towers designed? Well, luckily for me, I am ridiculously familiar with these structures. <laughs> Don't ask me why. The top floor is sloped towards the center, and there's a drain in the floor that leads down through the core. The story is that this is to collect rainwater that was designed to feed down into a cistern, a cavity in the substructure that collected water. There was also a pump to pull the water up from the cistern to the top floor, supposedly to drink. I don't know why you'd want dirty floor water as your drink water, especially a floor that is probably covered in gunpowder, but that's the official story. I'm proposing here that they also don't want you to see that there's also a pipe that leads down under the ground towards the courthouse. You could just drain the water straight from the lake into a hole all the way under the courthouse if you really wanted to, but I think that they had to lift the water up to that roof to get enough water pressure to run that water fountain. You can see overflow drains in lakes around the world that work on the same principle as the Sphinx water inlet. Once the water in the lake rises to a certain level, it drains down into a hole, stopping it from flooding the town nearby. With the Martello Towers, I'm thinking the cistern probably was a water reservoir, a collection tank for lake water, and the pump was to pull it up from there and then down through the floor drain, out through another pipe, which would then feed it to the water fountain and the courthouse. There are hundreds of Martello Towers around the world. They may vary in build quality and in size, but the design is universal. So to prove that I'm right, I set out to find one example, just a single example, of one of these Martello Towers depicted to have a pipe leading out from the structure There you go. In the Tesla experiment, the brick building had a water pump with a heater meant to keep the water a certain temperature. It would constantly be cycling in and out of that structure. Whatever the brick building was doing mimics the secondary structure from these grids. But going right from Egypt to the Victorian era, we're missing a lot of stages. There were a lot of steps in between. This technology evolved with us. Or so the conspiracy theory says. Today, the only technology like this that has survived is HARP. There are several of these facilities around the world and they use the principles of Tesla's work to manipulate the ionosphere, which theoretically could manipulate weather or even cause earthquakes. So when you scale Tesla's technology up, it can do some crazy stuff. If they really did have Tesla technology in the Victorian era and these grids really were power plants, I can only imagine what that must have been like. How would it look when all of these structures were working in tandem with each other. What would have these parks have been like to hang out in? And what was the black powder for? Were they really burning it all the time or were they just burning it for special occasions? I mean, with enough water fountains spraying up mist and all that dust and smoke ionizing the air, that would have been a pretty amazing spectacle. And remember, this video is just for fun. I'm. I'm not, I'm not being serious. I'm just saying, hypothetically, imagine what it would have looked like in the heyday of this hypothetical other civilization. Wait a second. There's another picture here that I forgot to put in the video. Hope you enjoyed my video tying Egypt to the Victorian era. Join me next time 
when I talk about everything in between.